Welcome to our service today. It's great to have you with us once again. Wonder how your week has been. For some, it's been full of joy and happiness. It's been a good week. For others, less so. More difficulties and challenges. Some have had to deal with health issues or family issues. Some are struggling with grief and loss. Regardless of our week, regardless of what we've experienced, we come today together to draw near to God, our loving God, to seek his presence through prayer, through singing of songs, reading from Acts and learning more about what it means to rely on God as our firm foundation. As we join together today, Let's listen to the words of the Psalms. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. This song is a great reminder of the hope we have in Jesus and the assurance we have that no matter what we're going through, he provides everything we need. Christ is mine forevermore. Mine forevermore. Come rejoice now, 
Offering is a theme that is spoken about throughout the Bible and not often with that word, but it is something that is significant as God's people give to the work of God in the places where they are. And I think so often it's easy for us to just kind of skip past offering or, uh, yeah, get distracted in the moment. But actually, when we come to offering, it's about giving the things that God has given us back to God in order that we can be a part of the things he is doing. And it comes in the form of giving our time, being involved in ministries, sharing the gospel with the people around us, reflecting Jesus in all that we do. It comes in the form of money, financially backing the things that God is at work in, giving money to the local church so that they can be a light to the community, have the resources that they need, to be able to sustain the ministries that take place so that we can be people focused and love people just like God loves us. So as we come to offering today, I don't want this to be something that you just skip past or kind of uh, dismiss or think that it doesn't matter because it does. And it's a time where I want to encourage you to intentionally think about the ways that you are currently partnering with God where he's working. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, you call us to partner with you in the things that you are doing in the places where you are at work. God, help us to know the ways that we can give the things that we have, our time, our money, our resources, our gifts and abilities, so that your work may be done and people may come to know you. We pray this in your son's almighty name. Amen. Our Father, we come to you as a God of love, a God who sent Jesus into this world for our salvation. We thank you for all that you have done for us. You're an amazing God, and we come and worship you this morning. We want to pray for our new diaconate. We thank you for them, and we pray for your blessing upon each one. For the steering committee as they work through the recommendations, we ask you, Heavenly Father, that you will clearly lead and guide, and us as a church as well. We want to pray for our Sunday school. We thank you for every young child loved by you. We pray that they will grow up to know you as their Saviour and Lord. We ask too, Lord, for the young people in our church. We thank you for each one of them. Help them to grow in their faith, to mature, to love you with all their heart and soul and mind and strength. And for each who attends life groups, we commit them to you, Lord, and pray that the meetings that we have in homes, various homes, we pray, Heavenly Father, that it will be more than an academic exercise, but we will apply the truths of your word to our heart and life, we pray. We ask for our pastoral staff. We pray for Andrew, we pray for Howard and Jess and for the admin staff as well. We commit each one of them to, to you with their various tasks. Will you encourage them? Will you bless them? Will you continue to have your hand upon them in every way we pray? We ask particularly for Jess as she is soon to move into a new realm of ministry, some description. We ask you, Lord, that you will clearly lead her and Alex at this time, we do pray. We think of the playtime group too. We thank you for those who are leading and we've been asked to pray for extra leaders for the playtime group. And we just commit this to you. Raise up leaders, we ask. 
the schools ministry with Nick and Darshana. Thank you for the money that's already come in when we trust you uh, to see more funds provided. Thank you for the incredible work that they do in the schools, we do pray. We pray for those who are grieving uh, the loss of uh, family and we ask that you will draw near, near to them, that they will know your love and care for them at this time, we pray. And for those who cannot attend church anymore because of frailty, Lord, may they know your peace. May they know that you are a God who loves them and cares for them, although they cannot meet with us. For our missionary family, both overseas and here in Australia, those who we are supporting, give them amazing opportunities to share your love with those they connect with, we do pray. And we continue to ask that they will know your peace, protection and enabling at this time. So thank you, Father. Thank you that we can pray to you as our Heavenly Father. You are our God and we worship and praise you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Bible reading is from Acts chapter 19, verses 1 to 22. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. 
On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years, so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to those who were ill, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, In the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honour. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. So as we continue in our service today, we come to Acts chapter 19. And indeed, we come to the end of our time in Acts, having spent the last few weeks following Paul's missionary journey from Acts 15 to chapter 19. What we've seen is how he's built a firm foundation for the churches to grow. So join me in your Bibles as we look at Acts 19, beginning to think through what was said last week in Acts 18. Incomplete. Incomplete was Apollos' knowledge of God, as recorded in Acts 18, verse 24. He knew scripture, but not Christ. Incomplete, incomplete faith. Priscilla and Aquila were there to explain the way of God more adequately in Acts 18, verse 26. We know from elsewhere in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, that Paul struggled. He said, I came to you, that is in Corinth, in weakness, with great fear and trembling. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. Howard reminded us last week that we can all experience discouragement and disappointment as we follow Jesus. But reading Paul's story and the story of the other apostles throughout Acts brings a measure of comfort as well. Paul shows by his example that keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus and his purposes will get us through and enable us to be strengthened. Incomplete, incomplete. We come to realize as we read on that we are all incomplete without Christ. As we read the first seven verses of Acts 19, we see 12 men who are incomplete. And yet, as Christians today, many of us remain incomplete. You could actually say that we are under construction. 
So let's follow the story through once again. From Acts, or from Acts 15 onwards, from the council at Jerusalem, we have followed Paul through Syria, Cilicia, Galatia, Troas, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, Corinth, Antioch, Ephesus, and back to Jerusalem, and many places in between. In chapter 19, we meet him at Ephesus, where he begins what we call his third missionary journey. Ephesus was the most prominent city in the Roman province of Asia Minor. He'd spent time there, we were told, traveling from place to place in Acts 18, strengthening the disciples. But Ephesus was to become his home for many months. Indeed, in Acts 19, verse 10, it says that he stayed two years, with many hearing about him and his teaching. Now, a couple of weeks ago, Jess and then I talked about Paul's missionary work in how he went along in Thessalonica and other places, going to the synagogue first. And then we saw that in Athens, when there was no synagogue to visit, he went to a place of meeting. There he met with Jews and the few, uh, a few Jews and the Greeks. In Corinth last week, Paul, we read, goes first to the synagogue, and then again we read here that he does the same. Yet in both Corinth and Athens, Ephesus, we read he chooses secular places or neutral places to teach for an extended period of time. As we look at how to communicate, we see he used the, uses verbs like reasoned, argue, or persuade. He uses them repeatedly. In Corinth, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue trying to persuade, Acts 18 verse 4. Then again, in Acts 19, verse 8, we read, He spoke boldly, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. In both cases, his teaching was wide-ranging and meticulous. Again, do you notice he made reasoned presentations over extended periods of time? So as we come to Acts 19, let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the joy of following this story through from the council in Jerusalem in Acts 15, all the way through here to Ephesians. Father, as we have journeyed over these past weeks, we've seen you at work. We pray that we might continue to see you at work in our lives as we seek to understand something more of your work in Paul for the gospel. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So with your Bibles, I hope you've got them there, Acts 19 verse 2, we read that actually it's really quite interesting that Paul specifically asked some disciples that he met whether they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed, Acts 19 verse 2. This suggests that people can actually know when they receive the Holy Spirit. Their response indicates that they have not even heard of the Holy Spirit, being disciples of John the Baptist, we presume, at this point. Bryson Smith uh, writes or describes their teaching as their teaching, understanding, and experience as incomplete. We have a repeat here of Acts 18 with Apollos. But now with 12 men coming to faith powerfully through the ministry of Paul, verse 7. This year I've discovered with joy something of the writings and indeed the old sermons of Catherine Booth, co-founder of the Salvation Army. Catherine Booth comments on the beginning of Acts and writes this. Tarry at Jerusalem till ye be endured with power. Mark that it is not truth merely. They had got the truth before. There is something besides truth needed. Paul says his gospel and his preaching were not merely in word, but in power and in the demonstration of the Spirit. And we've seen this repeatedly, haven't we? In Acts 15 to chapter 19, Paul works with power in the Holy Spirit to bring about life change to those in need of hearing the gospel. Time and again in this sermon series, we've heard of the apostles not only preaching, but endowed with godly power. So these disciples of John, 
were ignorant of the Pentecost and had not progressed in their faith and understanding, which tends to suggest that they were not true believers yet. Yet Luke, in verse 1, look at it in, in your Bibles, calls them disciples. We can take it that they were called disciples by Luke, who does not evaluate their faith, but he, evaluate their faith here, but merely records their aspiration. This state does not last long as Paul baptizes them, leading them to faith in Jesus, and as such, they receive the Holy Spirit as evidenced by the receiving gifts of the Spirit. Paul, we read on in verse 8, enters the synagogue, as we've seen him do time and time again as he travels round. So as he travels, he speaks here for three months, arguing persuasively or intentionally, as we said a couple of weeks ago, about the kingdom of God. However, we understand that he not only talked in the synagogue, he succeeded in bringing the gospel to the whole of the province. Verse 10, how does he do this? Well, let's read on. His base for the majority of his time was the lecture hall of Tyrannus resulting after a further two years that the gospel prospered throughout the area. In verses 11 to 22, we read of some extraordinary things, the background of which is seen in the reputation that Ephesus already had, that of being a center of magical arts, says A.J. A.J.S. Fernando. Through the use of handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched Paul, people are healed. Luke is keen, though, in verse 11, to stress God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Look at it. Verse 11, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. It wasn't Paul, it was God. To the 21st century Christian, this may seem strange. And yet the next verses are stranger still. The picture of the seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, raises the question as to who they are. F.F. F. Bruce, a New Testament scholar, says that the Jewish chief priest was indeed a self-designation and therefore to be held lightly today. He goes on to say, Luke would have placed the term Jewish high priest within quotation marks had they been invented in his day. I love that phrase and commentary. Time and again, we are reading here of abuse in the power of Jesus' name. And Paul seeks to counter that. The story continues, and the seven sons, some scriptures mention only two sons, attempt to exorcise the demon in the man. But the demon does not recognize the son's power, and they run fleeing, naked and wounded. Bruce goes on to say that the whole atmosphere of this passage, in fact, tallies admirably with the reputation which Ephesus had in antiquity as a centre of magical practice. Now, you may remember from school that Shakespeare in the Comedy of Errors, Act 1, Scene 2, makes mention of the nature of Ephesus. They say the town is full of cosage as nimble jugglers that deceive the eye, dark working sorcerers that change the mind, soul-killing witches that deform the body, disguised cheaters, pratting mountebacks, and many such like the liberties of sin. Now, Shakespeare may not be your thing, but you will recall without doubt the opening of Ephesians chapter 1, when Paul writes so beautifully about the spiritual blessings that can abound in the heavenlies. Reminding us in verse 3 of chapter 1 onwards of the blessing received by those who respond to the blessing available in the heavenly realms. He speaks before his time of almost being awake to the radio waves of heavenly blessing which in understanding something of the perceived magical nature of the society in Ephesus makes perfect sense to write in such a way a few years later. To those who've come to Christ against the backdrop of society, the society in Ephesus, the narrative continues. Look at it with me, won't you? Verse 15. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know, 
and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that he ran out of the house. They ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When his when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachma. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely as they grew in power. As you can see, this resulted in a dramatic turnaround in the culture and society at Ephesus, resulting, as verse 20 says, in the word of the Lord spreading widely and growing in power. Do you notice that here Luke mentions a growth in power? Just as Catherine Booth mentioned it many years ago. Again, showing its relevance among a people living under the bondage of de demonic powers. Such was the resolution that Paul decided to move on. After at least two years, he leaves behind a strong and vibrant church. John Stott, in his commentary on Acts, asks us to think on Paul's missionary strategy. Now, Howard spoke of Paul's time in Corinth last week, lasting up to two years. Here we can make an argument for almost three years in Ephesus. John Stott says, when we contrast much contemporary evangelism with Paul's, its shallowness is immediately shown up. Our evangelism tends to be too ecclesiastical, inviting people to church, whereas Paul took the gospel to the secular world. Too emotional, he says, for it appeals for a decision without adequate basis of understanding, such as teaching. Too superficial, brief encounters where Paul stayed for five years in two cities. If you want to do a bit of study, why not take time to think about how Paul seems to have founded the seven churches mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. For all roads converge in Asia, Asia Minor on Ephesus. But as we continue on in Acts 19, it becomes obvious that the spiritual world is real. Ephesus, as we have seen, is well known for its magical properties. Today we have travelled to the opposite extreme, become so modern that we often discount the spiritual. We must not go from one extreme to the other. We must not blame everything on the demons or get a morbid interest in the devil, nor discount him totally. Yet 19 Acts 19 and the book of Ephesians reminds us that there is a supernatural battle going on. We see in Acts 19 that the gospel affects people's lives and allows for change in character and attitude. In doing so, we see the power of God at work as mentioned in verse 20. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, talks about putting on the full armour of God. Look it up. Here in Acts 19, we realise why he writes that. As we see, it is folly being unreal with God. When someone with, a spirit, when someone with the spiritual power tried to do the same thing as Paul had been doing, it led to calamity for them. Acts 19 verses 13 to 16, as we've seen. If we start playing games with the occult, with witchcraft and occultism, we find that we've taken on board more than we can handle. Turn again to Christ. Finally, we see that the key to spiritual blessing is for us to radically amend our ways. The result of people knowing about what happened to the seven sons led in Acts 19 verse 18 to a powerful spiritual awakening in which many came to faith in Jesus. There is not just one time to act, though initial repentance is still very important. If we are to be constantly growing spiritually, we must constantly be amending our ways. We see here in Ephesus many are changed. Many are changed not only in Ephesus but in the surrounding area because they made a decisive break with their past. 
We read more and more about the effects of this in the second part of Acts 19, verses 23 to the end of the chapter. We see that opposition grows. But just before I close, do you notice what it cost to themselves to make this break? The people burned all the scrolls so they could never be used again at great cost to themselves. These Ephesian converts said, we want nothing to survive at all from our wicked past. One of the reasons why such blessing came to Ephesus is because people not only radically broke away from their sin, but from anything that was associated with their past sins. There are a couple of hymns or songs that we could choose to sing now. The first is a traditional hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. Or there is a more modern song called No Turning Back by Brendan Heath. Why not look, up, look them up on Apple Play or Spotify? Both of them point to a resurrection, Jesus, and a life with him. Let's come to God in prayer now. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to reflect on Acts 19. As we've seen the gospel go out from Jerusalem in Acts 15, through the journey around Asia Minor, we pray your continued blessing on your message today as it goes out around the world. Help us, those who are listening today, to hear the gospel and respond to it to accept the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and to see his power at work in converting and enabling us to live for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let there be no higher name. 
Jesus, Son of God, you lay down your perfect life. You are the sacrifice, Jesus, Son of God. On the altar of our praise, let there be no And so we come to the end of our series on Acts, Acts 15 to 19, a firm foundation. We've seen repeatedly that Paul has laid a firm foundation for the church to grow. Let's close our service today by giving thanks for that mission and indeed our own continuing mission. Let's come to God in prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this series. We thank you for all that we have learned. We pray that we might see afresh a demonstration of the power of the gospel at work in our lives and in the lives of those who come to faith in you. Bless and encourage each of us, we pray. In Jesus' name, Amen.